So I suppose what interests me about this panel is that in their professional life and in their personal life, they've interacted with the business of upgrading building stock, creating the business case, I suppose, with their significant others as well as with their other significant others. So, um, Brian, seeing as you're closest to me, we might start with you, and I suppose tell us about your personal journey through your upgrade to start. Yeah, um, I uh, bought a house in, uh, in uh, 19, was it 19, sorry, early 2000, we, we moved house from a small three bed, we had a growing family uh, out, to a, out to a bigger home. At the time, it was built in 19, late 1960s, uh, it was a still had kerosene boiler uh, in the home. Little boiler room off, off the back of the kitchen that when you went into was just a, like a black hole. Um, so one can imagine what, was, what else was around the house that you couldn't see. We subsequently then decided to do a, a renovation, a kind of generational renovation of the house. Would have transitioned to, to gas uh, at that time. Thought we had done a very good job in terms of the standards we had applied at the time in terms of um, dry lining, insulation of, a, of an extension, etc., cetera, uh, underfloor heating, et cetera. So we've done a, a lot of very good work. Um, then in, in, in 2015, um, I suppose in the context of my professional activities, I, I, I came across uh, Paul Kenny from Tipperary Energy Agency at the time, was, uh, was pioneering kind of deep retrofit in terms of what, what we needed to do our homes. I suppose it was very difficult in the role I was in to resist um, the, uh, the convincing. Um, so what we did then at that stage was to, to transition away from gas to a heat pump. But part of that, uh, that journey involved quite a bit of work around addressing some of the quality issues that existed in terms of the work we'd done previously. Primarily air tightness. Um, we did an air tightness test on the house and we were losing 15, 15 air changes per hour was the measurement at the time. The work we got done, which primarily was, was very manual uh, in terms of insulation, sealing of attic doors, sealing of doors, etc., got us down to five air changes per hour. Combine that with a, a demand control ventilation system, because uh, at the time we had observed um, mold and moisture becoming very apparent in, in, particularly in, in, in one shower room, despite the fact that we had, we had what you call natural ventilation at the time. Um, so put in a demand control ventilation system to address that. So, I mean, with, literally within, within um, I'd say, a week or two of, of, of that going in and having, obviously, we had painted up the areas we'd, we'd, we'd done some work to, like we're here now four or five years later and there's not a sign of any mold or any condensation in any of the rooms. And in fact, just the general air quality in the house, uh, there's been a kind of a significant improvement. Um, but I suppose, I mean, the challenges at, at the time, I mean, obviously the work, so we were lucky enough that we could stay in the home because we had, the main, main issues for us was drilling of, of a couple of the walls for the piping for the demand control ventilation. Uh, a bit of, a lot of work in the utility room to, to uh, integrate the heat pump. Um, but I think overall, it was a very positive experience and one that um, I think once you go through the, the journey, I know you're going to ask the question later, once you go through the bit of getting it done, yeah. once you experience it, it's been very positive. And certainly, um, I think overall, um, my, my, my wife, who necessarily wasn't necessarily you know, pushing to, uh, to go to, to move away from, from, from gas, we had a lo lovely gas fire that she was very disappointed to lose, uh, loved her climate for turning the heating on and off um, when she was coming home from work, etc. So I think, but overall, we got, got accustomed to, to, the, to how we how we manage the house, uh, and overall a very, a very positive experience. Great. Um, Ali, do you want to give us an outline of your own journey? Yeah, so um, we're a young-ish family um, from Kildare, and we were looking to settle back in Maynooth after being abroad for a few years. And ideally, the plan at the time had been to try and find a turnkey A-rated home that was in line with our values and what we wanted for our home. Um, but with the market availability and cost, they became limitations. So we started to look at plan B um, and look at door uppers in the area. So we found a home that ticked all the other boxes besides efficiency uh, in terms of location and potential. But it was, uh, let's say, underloved, to say the least, at the time. So then, having been on oil, we started to initially look at the gas option and just one of those nuances in, in um, infrastructure, our estate, actually every only second cul-de-sac has gas as a possibility. And Unfortunately, our one didn't have one. But then that started to get the, the mind thinking about what's, what could be next, and deep retrofit started to be talked about. And again, having known Superhomes and Paul, um, it was really uh, an interesting option for us then at the time. So 
yeah, we, we embarked on the process to bring the house, which was a, a D3. It's about 25 years old. Um, it achieved an A2, and I'm sure you'll share the stress of the day the test goes through and the, the kind of pride you get when it achieves the house. But um, it, was a, it was a great experience. I know we'll discuss the detail of it in a moment. But for us, it was very important that we were able, as a family, to, to live our values in our home life. And that, that option of deep retrofit um, with the Super Homes program and the grants made that a possibility. So we're, we're in the home now just under a year, um, still figuring it out, still trying to um, get used to what is a different way of living in terms of, of heating, a um, very pleasant way of living, but, but different. Um, and so yeah, really interested now to see what this winter will bring in terms of performance as well. Great. Mike, do you want to give us part of your story? Yeah, I mean, look, I'm principal of Goethe in Agricultural College in Tipperary, at least I'm retiring principal of Goethe in College in Tipperary. Um, and Really, the kickstart for Gertine was the crash of the Celtic Tiger. Um, because when the Celtic Tiger crashed, we were a small private agricultural college with lots going on. Um, but the government basically turned around to us at that time and said, you're going to get 100 grand a year less money than you used to get to run the education. And we looked at our non-farming bills. We did something with the farming bills. We looked at our non-farming bills, and our two biggest bills by far were heat and um, electricity. And when we were burning peat through an old peat burning boiler, and you're looking at it at end of life, and you're faced into a bill of 100 grand for oil, to replace it with straight oil boilers, we started fairly quickly investigating biomass boilers, and biomass boilers led to looking at actually growing fuel on site with Willow. Um, and we now produce about 80% of our heat from the Willow field. Costs us now about five grand a year to dry it, and five grand to harvest it and we then top up with about 10 grand with the timber. So our fuel bill now is about 20 grand, saved us some money that the government had taken off in the first place. Um, we also at the time looked at electricity and investigated um, wind turbines. We investigated solar panels. At the time, wind was the right thing to do. Small wind turbine, 50 kilowatt wind turbine put in. Um, but again, Tipperary Engines, we mentioned earlier, they've been great friends of mine. They came along with um, potential energy efficiency, because somebody said to me when I first started looking, it's been mentioned several times today, look at how you can reduce before you look at how you can produce differently. Mm -hmm. And so Gertine was in this position in 2009 with a 1960s built concrete slab of a building with no insulation, old buildings, other things. So we literally just did what we could in terms of insulation around the place um, uh, to reduce the heat bill. Silly things at the time, like somebody came along and said, how do we reduce electricity in terms of lighting? We took out half the fluorescent tubes in the college because we didn't need them all um, when you actually measured lux levels. So we did that. Um, so serve grant appeared through Tipperary Engine, which made it possible for us to do this. And then more recently, as we got towards the end of the 2000s, again, the next round of energy efficiency came in. We found some more, again, grant driven because it makes sense. I think that was the thing for us that we, we have to make the, the bills meet at the end of the day. And so there's been investments in solar PV panels now. We've changed all the lighting in the college to LED lighting. Because in 2009, LEDs didn't work. We, put, we, we piloted three or four LED floodlights in 2009, and they just weren't good enough then around for safety. But they work on LEDs across the college now. We've built a new milking parlor, again, looking to save energy with variable speed pumps. The heating systems all have variable speed pumps. So you're all the time trying to reduce the energy bill where you can and then save in other areas. I think, I think what's notable here is in your story, Mike, the, the first domino to fall was a hard budget constraint. Sorry? Was, but there was a hard budget constraint. Someone said, Absolutely. you will not have that budget next yes. year. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to explore, just because it's both residential with, with Ali and yourself, Brian, uh, Ali perhaps first. Um, you bought, as you said yourself, a doer-upper. Yeah. Um, and you thought, as I'm doing this up, I could go a little bit yeah. further. In your case, Brian, you had done some work, and then more recently you decided to shift to a decarbonized heating system, so from that gas boiler to an electric boiler. Um, what was your nudge when you did that? So you were going to do up your home, Ali. What made you think, actually, I can do something more? So for Mike, that first domino was a hard budget constraint. For you, what was that? little piece that said, I'm now going to look into this and take it seriously. And then, Brian, a similar question to you. Yeah, I mean, besides from, obviously, the, the values and ideals drove it, but the practicalities had to line up. 
and for that, the level of work we needed to do to the house, regardless of energy efficiency, to make it livable and comfortable for the family, involved pretty much gutting it anyway. Um, and it was going to be unlivable for the few months. So yeah, at that stage, the option of, of super homes and, and the, the level of work that needed to be completed slotted in as a feasible option for us. You know, if we'd been living in the home, we had to do that level of demolition and rebuild at the time. I'm not sure we would have been able to be able to carry that out. So it kind of lined up for us like that as well. Um, and then I suppose being fully honest and being transparent to the process with the banks, they were very good with us in terms of mortgage and everything like that. So we got to stay on the mortgage to stall repayments until we were in the house as well. And again, that comes to the budget and what was feasible for us. So it was those kind of range of things that lined up um, to, that put it on the table. Yeah. I think t timeliness becomes very important. Even if you look yeah. at the UK, they're looking at a specific incentive aligned to stamp duty. Yeah. If you bring your home up that decarbonisation ladder, you can get a specific accommodation there because you might be upgrading your home at the time of home change. And I think it's something to, to keep in mind here. We could also align it to mortgages or green mortgage packages. Mm -hmm. uh, Brian, yourself? Yeah, Jim, I suppose, look, I mean, to, to, be, to be perfectly honest about it, I mean, in the business and in the role I was in, uh, I had spent maybe 18 months or two years looking at this. As you know, a lot of work has gone on within ESB around looking at the decarbonisation journey, what we needed to do as a business, and obviously looking at the heating sector in particular, you know, we had identified um, technologies that existed that could facilitate uh, a, more, a, more, a deeper decarbonisation of the home. So it's easy, it's easy um, you know, sit in a job and talk about it and go out and tell people it's a great idea. I think you need to put your hand in your pocket yourself. Um, I was lucky in that I wasn't, you know, because we had done a job pr prior to that. We were probably at a B3 at that stage. The, the depth of my pockets didn't have been as deep as others have had to go to in terms of what they're trying to do. So it was an overall 18,000 euro kind of investment, which was uh, supported by a BC scheme, the same of about 30% of that, 35% of that cost. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I mean, again, it probably was, it, it was a little bit of a leap of faith in the context that it wasn't something, you know, we were looking to do. Um, I suppose it was only as you start to, uh, to uh, explore what's going on, what are the drivers and consider your own behaviors and what's going on in your house, looking at your bills in a bit more detail, you realize that there is scope to benefit. Um, Happy to say that next month I'll have paid the last um, repayment on my on my uh, loan from the credit union. So um, I, you know it's it's a, it's, a, it's a relatively short payback. We've definitely seen benefits in the, in our in our in our energy bills. Uh, but I think more importantly, just in terms of how the house feels, I think I think Ali touched on it. It just you know you, you, I know it's maybe going back to <laughs> Ronald's comment earlier about you know we wouldn't know what temperatures are outside you know in reality. So in our house we have a whatever our comfort level is around 2021, 20, we, we would, uh, Ron would be delighted to hear, we do pull the temperatures down at night because we don't need the same temperature upstairs and we're everyone tucked up in bed. But you can manage the environment very well. So um, I think it's, it's uh, something, you know, I, I, I'll admit I did because of the, the role I was in, but certainly having, having experienced it, I think um, I would, I'd be very quick to recommend it, you know. Great. Um, just a sort of final round of questions for you. I'll start with you, Mike. In terms of the journey you went on, um, we, we tend to, and even state agencies sometimes tend to speak to the positive case study and the seven things that went brilliantly well for all of the people who engaged in a program. What were the speed bumps or the bullets that were just yeah. dodged along the way? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's, there's two major speed bumps that we've had. Um, and one, I don't know whether we've dodged it or we're working through it. Um, we bought a wind turbine from a company in Canada, very reputable, that went bankrupt. The company that took over the company went bankrupt. It's just hard work getting spare parts to keep it moving at the moment. So, you know, but you do all your research, you get what you want, and, you know, we'll get there with that. The other biggest speed bump, everybody thinks insulation's wonderful. And we had an old 1960s built building that has a foot-thick concrete slab roof, and in history, the roof got lovely and warm with the heat that went up to it, and it was never a problem we had to use a bagged insulation between the suspended ceiling and the roof um, because it was the only way it could be done because there was all sorts of services in there that we might need to get to. We got all the bags of insulation up there. We thought we'd done a wonderful job. And three months later, water started pouring through the ceilings where small amounts of heat had now got up to a cold concrete slab and condensed and water was pouring down through the ceiling. So that was quite a major speed bump that was actually relatively simply solved. We couldn't put any more insulation in so we had to get ventilation above the insulation, which meant 
somebody spending a long time drilling four inch cores through a ring beam, but look, by the by. So it was a major speed bump at the time, and as the boss man, you suddenly sit there thinking, what on earth have I done? Um, but you get through it, and you look back now and you say that the college has now, on its heating bills, been saving, well, at oil prices of $80 a barrel, we've been saving 80 grand a year for nine years. And if oil went up to $160 a barrel, we'd be saving 160 grand a year. And it's there for the next 20 years. So speed bumps are there, things happen, but you have to have the determination to say, right, what's the solution rather than, oh, it doesn't work, I think. That's it. Um, Ali or Brian, any personal thoughts? Yeah, I think we were kind of gluten for punishment. Uh, in addition to the deep retrofit, we changed the layout of the house as well in, in the doing. Um, and probably was very naive in terms of timelines and what could be achieved. So there was a bit of pressure on site with the different elements, trying to get it completed for the timelines um, and the grants. And sometimes when you've got, like anything, different parties working together and trying to manage the communication. You know, I remember coming home one day and there was a window in the, the wrong wall and just trying to manage all that and work around it um, to make sure you're still hitting the deadlines. Um, but yeah, they're workable through and it's just, I suppose, being realistic about the timelines and the expectation and, and that's definitely a lesson learned for me anyway, yeah. Yeah, I'd say it's kind of two things really. One, one I think Ali just touched on the bears is when you're dealing with multi-trades, just the coordination of the work in the home. Um, can be, can be challenging at times. Um, obviously when you're doing it, when you're trying to have a, a normal family life as well and they're uh, using concrete saws to take out holes, put holes in your walls, etc. a lot of dust around the place. So um, probably the, even though it was not as uh, inconvenient as I know others have been through, but certainly that just that kind of, the nature of not fully understanding what's gonna happen when it's on and then realizing it's actually a little bit more inconvenient than you thought. And the second thing was more practical issue. Obviously we had installed uh, underfloor heating downstairs and, and uh, we had two zones downstairs. We had some rads for the sitting room and we had underfloor for the kitchen and the hall. Um, and I suppose one, one, one of the, what happened was we, there was a, the new controller for the heat pump went into the kitchen and has a built-in thermostat. And uh, I remember coming home one evening and the place was feeling fierce cold and what's going on here? And I looked and I discovered that my, my wife had lit a candle um, on, on the sideboard, literally underneath the thermostat. So that, you know, there had never been a thermostat before. So now it was a flame <laughs> under the uh, thermostat. So the, the thing never, never thought the place was cold, you know? So, so simple things that you remember, look, even the location of thermostats is really important as well. You forget, we have a, a lot of glazing at the back of the house that you, there is a, there's a, there's a temperature kind of gradient from the, the hot wall down to the, to the glazing. So you need to find a place to put your thermostat that actually reflects the temperature at the, the, you know, at the least warm place. Um, so they're, they're, they're the kind of practical things when you're, because when, you know, we were lucky that we didn't have a lot of other, we weren't doing anything else to the house other than purely the change of heating system, the DCV, and obviously the LED lighting and stuff, which was relatively painless anyway, you know. Right. I, think, I think some of the points being made reflect on what Roger also stated, where uh, through, through behavioral change, we can reduce our CO2 impact today, tomorrow, on the walk home. Um, but after we use some of these measures and technologies, there also is a behavioral change. So it is only as smart a technology as we make it at the end of the day. Absolutely. And I think, uh, I think we all need to recognize that. Uh, I had Luke give me the signal for five minutes, about five minutes ago. I'm just wondering, am I? Okay, right. Uh, so I think we're going to wrap up, uh, unless there was anything more that any of you would like to say in terms of burning issues or that we haven't covered. No, I think just one of the, just to pick up on one thing that um, I think that Ronald said about the importance of ensuring that our, I suppose, we continue to build what we're building now. It's important that it's future-proof for 2050. Um, so I think there's a, there's a huge challenge there, and there's been very positive developments in the building regs in, in, in Ireland in particular. I think they are uh, a good bit ahead of our, some of our European neighbours, but I think there's a bit more we can do there to uh, to decarbonise further. So I think I think building the new buildings, I think, is a huge opportunity for Ireland to to embrace that. Well said. Ali? I know we've lost to think about on the back of um, Ronald's presentation, but even when you were talking earlier about you know, how do we get this at scale, there's nothing better than a good example. And I've even seen from my own cul-de-sac, my neighbours, it's been a great way to meet them, just genuinely mm. interested in the technology, wanting to feel it, touch it, see the data, and now having those conversations at home. So while, yes, we're going to scale, I think the, those one-off houses, I hope, will have had value uh, to show what's possible. Um, and again, just to show people what, what's, what their life could like in their house. Yeah. That's great. Uh, I'd just like to thank our panellists, uh, Brian, Ali and Mike, for their time. And I hope you had some value out of the session. <laughs>